welcome everyone to this Evelyn Neal Sims Native Plant Lecture. Uh, I want to introduce myself. I'm Joanna Lalikas. I am the Director of Education here. I want to also introduce with the uh, headphones on in the back, David Michaud. He is keeping us going here on Zoom and will help us with moderation of Q&A here today. Claire Shu, uh, I want to thank her. She was at the registration desk so many others that have helped to make this come to fruition today. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Damon Waite, the director of the garden. He's going to share a history of this wonderful lecture that we have with us this evening. Damon, thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Hello and welcome both virtually and in real life to the North Carolina Botanical Garden the official home of the soon-to-be national basketball champions, North Carolina Tar Heels. Yeah. So before I introduce you to our special guest today, I'd like to give you a little history about the annual Evelyn McNeil Sims Native Plant Lecture. Every spring, the garden has offered a lecture focused on native plants, their conservation, and ecology. The lecture series was initiated in 2000 with a gift from former Botanical Garden Foundation board member, active committee member, and honorary director, Nancy Preston. Nancy, please stand up and be recognized. <laughs> Nancy wanted to honor her mother, Evelyn McNeil Sims, on the occasion of her 90th birthday. And let me be clear, it was her mother's 90th birthday, not Nancy's. Um, Born in Lumberton, Mrs. Sims was educated at UNC Greensboro and later moved to Kingsport, Tennessee with her husband and daughter. And wildflower excursions in the mountains surrounding Kingsburg were a favorite activity for Mrs. Sims. And she eventually became a volunteer guide at Bay Mountain Nature Park. So Evelyn uh, contributed generally, generously to the James and Delight Allen Education Center where you're sitting today. And in fact, the Sims Preston Breezeway, not named after Sims Preston, but the collective Sims Preston. Sims, um, oh, I also want to recognize Sims Preston. He's the current vice president of the North Carolina Botanical Garden Foundation. Um, but the breezeway that's between this building and the next one where the picnic, um, the umbrellas and everything are, that was um, thanks to the Sims Preston family. So this lecture series spot Lights, native plants, their cultivation and conservation ecology, as I said. Uh, these subjects are especially appropriate because Mrs. Sims loved her wildflowers and her botanical explorations. Um, she attended le this lecture um, from her 90th birthday well into her hundreds. Um, and in 2016, after Mrs. Sims passed away at the age of 104, um, Nancy and Ed, sitting next to Nancy is Ed, established a permanent endowment to make sure the garden can continue to offer this free lecture um, every spring. So over the last 22 years, we've had an impressive list of biologists, botanists, conservationists, naturalists, and writers addressing this audience every spring with one exception, and that was in 2020 due to the global pandemic. So we can't go back in time and recapture that year, but we can recapture the speaker that was scheduled for that year. And she's here with us tonight. Julie Moore is an endangered species biologist, active in native plant organizations and local land trust. She's past president of the Botanical Society of Washington, DC, a board member of the Longleaf Alliance and the B.W. Wells Association. And I had the honor of serving with her on the board of the North Carolina Plant Conservation Program, where she is currently the chair. Julie retired from the US Fish and Wildlife Service after 15 years as the national coordinator of the Safe Harbor Program. Safe Harbor engages private landowners um, to conserve species on their own land. And she continues that work today as the brains behind VenusFlytrapChampions.org. Are you gonna talk about that? Good. Um, this recognizes and assists landowners in North and South Carolina who want to manage populations of Venus flytraps on their own land. So author of Managing the Forest and the Trees, 
Billy knows everything there is to know about longleaf pine management and restoration. I've been in the field with her. She was selected by the North Carolina Longleaf Coalition as a recipient of the 2020 Illustrious Palustrous Award. Um, so if you ever get the opportunity to be in the field with Julie, seize it. Um, she arrives with class and panache in her two seat convertible Mercedes Benz. And then she'll take you on a journey through whatever ecosystem you happen to be in. And tonight she's gonna take us all on a journey of over the last 50 years of conservation in the state of North Carolina. Please welcome Julie Moore. We all go outside. <laughs> what a gorgeous day. I'm delighted you all could find time to listen to me talk about various things. And I think I'm supposed to turn this on. Is that right? Okay. I don't know exactly where to start. 50 years is a long time. I sometimes forget I've been in this business that long. I came to Chapel Hill as a graduate student in the summer of 1969. That was a long time ago. My life went in several different directions than I ever thought it would. You all know about the herbarium that's part of the botanical garden. Well, I worked in the herbarium. That was my job, my assistantships. And I thought I would end up running a, botanical, uh, a herbarium, a plant collection. Well, I went in another direction and I'm glad I did. I went out into the real world and try to work and educate people to understand what's around them and to encourage them to do something about it. And what I'm gonna to do tonight is really talk about some of my experiences starting here at the Botanical Garden when I did a lot of work here early on and then go into other things that I've worked on and things that I'm working on today that I'd like to engage you all to help with. There's so much to do. We really need to get busy. And I hope I'm busy enough today uh, to engage you all in some of these activities. I came here as a graduate student, as I said, and I went to Tulane as an undergraduate and I spent my time in swamps and marshes. And it was so nice to get up here and to be able to go into terra firma and to, to see things here. And I um, was very fortunate to have Richie Bell as my major professor as an undergrad, as a graduate student. But there's something I have to tell you and I have to figure out how to say this nicely. <laughs> it wasn't about Richie, it was about my ex-husband, my favorite ex-husband, Ken Moore, who was here at the garden. And I'm sure many of you all have run into him and know him. And I'll refer to him a lot because he got me into a lot of trouble through the years and engaged with the botanical garden, especially. And he's called me three times in the last two days to tell me what I should tell you all. <laughs> and I'll try to remember some of those things. But because of his work here at the garden, when there was just a green shed, have you all ever seen the green shed behind the Totten building? Well, that was the whole office for many years. And I spent many cold nights in that thing, waiting for him to finish up whatever it was, or he helped me write the reports that I was working on. But it was uh, an interesting time in trying to figure out what the garden was actually going to be doing and how they were going to move. I did a lot of teaching of classes. One set, uh, Ann Harris set up, uh, was working with teachers across North Carolina. At that point, they were building schools and they had outdoors land around the school, which was great because you could just walk out of the classroom and see trees or ponds or water or whatever. And so we did classes, the garden put on classes for about, I'd say probably seven or eight different school systems across North Carolina. And working with teachers was so rewarding, how imaginative they could be. I was a little worried about one of the teachers who was a home ec teacher. I thought, I'm going to be teaching people how to identify plants and all kinds of that technical things. She was the best student I had, and she knew how to use so many native materials, bay leaves, just all kinds of things. Plus, she had her students do flower arrangements and identify all the plants that came from right outside the school. Other teachers did other amazing things. You would pick the name of a plant bachelor's buttons, spring beauty. And she'd have the children, her students, draw what it looked like. The, what, what does that name make you think of? And then they would have to look in books and figure out what they were. So that was her connection. So these teachers were so creative in figuring out 
how to get information across. I really learned a lot about teaching from them. Um, and it was a special time. And the garden hasn't done anything like that, I don't think, in a long time. But I don't think it's a bad idea to help these teachers get students, get their, I'll call them children, young people out. Because it's hard if you don't like the outer world as a child to become comfortable if you're outside as an adult. I really realized that through the years. Where to start? Yesterday, I was up at B.W. Wells, a Rock Cliff Farm. Have any of you all have heard of B.W. Wells? Well, he was a great inspiration for the botanical garden. And because of the things he wrote about the natural gardens of North Carolina, this is one of his original books. And the spine has Venus flytrap. I didn't realize that. I've had this book for how many years? And uh, it like embossed little designs of fly traps. He was the first person as a professor at NC State to go out and meet the public. He could teach anybody anything. And he also liked to dance and he was lots of fun. But he really made an effort to engage the public in conservation and understanding the diversity of this state, which is tremendous. People ask me why I came back to North Carolina after being in Washington, DC and working other places. And I said, well, it's the most exciting place conservation wise. There's such a marvelous conservation community here to work with. We have all the universities, but we also have a, a people who are interested in the outer world and want to know about it. And I can tell you when I was in Mississippi, I didn't run into many of those people. <laughs> B.W. Wells yesterday, we were out uh, on his, put have been his land that's now part of the Corps of Engineers managed by state parks. And we had people doing all kinds of outdoor activities. We had little kids making baseballs that he used to teach them how to do. We had uh, kids going up in ropes and trees. And boy, did I wish I could have done that. That was just, I don't even know how they did it, but they had a whole rope system and they could swing around up there in the trees. That was pretty cool. I led a wildflower walk. The Botanical Garden donated uh, plant material. We raffled that off and also gave out the packets that the garden has put together, the wildflower of the year seeds. And people were quite taken with those. So the garden has had a long relationship uh, with uh, B.W. Wells. And this book has been redone many times now. If you all ever see this for sale, buy it. It's hard to find. Chuck Rowe, who's here, found one once and called me from Asheville and said, do you need another copy? And he got it for me. And it was redone in modern fashion with an update. And it really talks a lot. And Dot Wilbur, who was here at the garden for years, did the illustrations for it. The old book just has very poor photos, to tell you the truth. However, Dr. Wells took slides, black and white, and then he hand tinted them colors. That's how long ago he was working, trying to get people engaged. And he thought if the, if the rose pinks were actually rose colored, maybe people would get more engaged with that. So this is a new book that's been done updating it, but it talks about how ecosystems, I'll use the big word, how these things work, why where, things grow where they do. Ed asked me at lunch, why fly traps grow where they do? Well, Dr. Wells was busy explaining fire, water, um, bad soils, good soils, all kinds of things. So people would get an idea why things grew where they did. And we still work on that all the time. That is one of my, to me, a very important part of appreciating nature and being a good conservation is you gotta know how things work. If you don't know how they work, you can go in weird, weird directions. I have a nice neighbor who thought all pollinators were honeybees. We got that straight. We really need to continue to educate ourselves. And it's just amazing what we can learn. And today uh, there's so many more opportunities than we used to have. And I think it's part of being good at what you do is understanding how things work. So you can really explain it coherently. And the other thing I'll say again and again is in talking language that people can understand. How many professors that I had that talked above the student's head? They all did, with one or two exceptions like Richie Bell, who could talk to people. Learning how to talk to people is part of the big, the big part of conservation. And we'll talk more about that. So I was up at B.W. Wells and it was great seeing what people could do up there and have fun outdoors, particularly the children. Um, the B.W. Wells was very active in a group that started in the 50s, which was called the North Carolina Wildflower Society. It's now called the North Carolina Native Plant Society. Dr. Totten was involved, Dr. Wells was involved, all kinds of professors in botany were involved in that early years of that group. It started in the 50s. 
when Ken and I were here, we met these people who were avid wildflower growers. And they were the ones who knew how to propagate plants. We didn't know a whole lot about it. And one of the things that was so unfortunate here when the garden started, would people would show up, I'll never forget this, going through that other gate on the other side, a man showed up with a crate of pink lady slippers and flowers to sell to the garden. Of course, they don't live. We now know they have to have a special fungi associated with the roots to grow. But that's how people got native plants. They were dug from the wild, from national forests, from private land, all kinds of places. But there was very little plant propagation going on, really almost none. And the wildflower people, really society, now Native Plant Society, had gotten to understand how to do those things. I had the good fortune, I think I was unemployed for a few months, to put together this little guide. And it's Native Plant Propagation Handbook. All kinds of people had submitted information through the newsletter the organization had and through just their handwritten notes that we put together into this guide. And all kinds of people helped with this guide, but I had to put it all together. I just wish I could remember everything that was in here because it was a first compilation for the South about how to really propagate plants from seeds, from cuttings, how the different techniques and what works and what doesn't work. And this has been reproduced, nothing very exciting, it's just printed. But Linda Lamb, who was on the, from Wilson on the board of the Botanical Garden, wanted a piece of a guide that you could put flat on the, that you didn't have to hold open and that had a waterproof cover and all kinds of things so that you could really use it when you had seeds and cuttings in your hand. You didn't have to look after it. And so she made sure that when this was printed that the people over in Durham waterproof cover who wouldn't smudge to make it practical to use because we needed to understand here at the Botanical Garden how to propagate plants, not how to endorse digging them up and not to think they all have to be rescued, that you can actually propagate plants. And that was a tremendous effort and took a good, good long while to work on that. From that effort, the Botanical Garden actually worked on a book and Harry Phillips, who's here on the back row, actually put it all together. A whole update of this and a lot of new information on plant propagation. And truth to tell, those efforts and the talks that Ken gave and other people gave across the country made this garden well known as a native plant garden. It was because we knew something that other people didn't know. There was something here going on that really could benefit people elsewhere. And now we know so much about it, but then we didn't know. And to see what people would bring in and try to sell here, plants that were parasitic, they dig them up and bring them in and don't you want this louse wart? It's like, well, it's gonna die because there's nothing, had to have root connections to another plant. So there was a lot going on in the early days of plant propagation that, that weren't going on, that needed to go on. And uh, it was really fascinating to see how fast that movement started moving and how many people came here from other areas to understand and see what was going on. And people are still coming here to understand. I bring people here periodically who get to meet the propagators and understand how it works and how it doesn't work. That's very important. The botanical. The Botanical Garden has put out lots of publications, but the Native Plant Society is still very active in North Carolina. And we have some handouts here about their selection of native ground covers, uh, favorite ferns, and I think ground covers, ground co uh, and just wildflowers that they put together. There's so many people now putting out information on how to work with native plants. It really is gratifying to me. This one is done by the same organization for the Piedmont. There's one for the coastal plain. There's information there today if you get interested in propagating yourself. We can all buy plants. I buy a tremendous number of plants. I kill a lot of plants. <laughs> One of the things that's happening now is so many nurseries of a general sort are growing native plants. They don't necessarily label them as native plants, but they're actually selling native plants that have been propagated. And I think that is really a, a miraculous uh, change than what we used to see, that you can find these things in a commercial nursery or a place that uh, you normally just has uh, bedding plants or, or, or pink dogwoods and that type of thing. So the word is out and people are propagating a lot of material so we can all find it to use in our gardens. And you can even add some things to your woods. <laughs> Living around native plants is exciting. 
I garden, but I grow everything. I grow a lot of natives too, but I'm not a purist. Some people are. You don't need to be, but we just do need to mix native plants in with uh, our cultivated plants. There are a lot of reasons, and I'm sure you all have heard a lot of the talks in regard to the difference, how animals, creatures of all sorts respond to native plants. And I think that we need to pay good attention to that. From the work with the garden and the native plant society, I ended up getting really into conservation in a big way because I had a job to walk all the land to find rare plants that's underneath the falls and Jordan reservoirs. When you see that many thousands of acres go underwater, never to grow plants again, it really does get to you. You re really realize what the lost was. And that was before there was even as much commercial development as there is today. This, this was a lot to lose a lot of our valuable bottom lands to be inundated forever. That was a major turning point in my life. And when you come across 54 across the New Hope Bottom, it smells terrible. <laughs> Have anybody ever smelled that when you go across? Open your windows next time. Makes me wonder what's going on in that reservoir, particularly the upper ends of it. But that got me into the conservation business. I went to work for the Natural Heritage Program, which was a program set up by the Nature Conservancy in North Carolina. When was it, Chuck? 56, uh, 76? That the garden, um, that the Natural Heritage Program started. Uh, the Botanical Garden was somewhat involved because of my interest, and we've all cooperated on various things through the years. And the Nature Conservancy chapter formed soon thereafter. They actually had the contract to set up the heritage program. Heritage programs now exist in all states. And the purpose was to find out what is in your state. What's rare? What's not rare? What's, what's unusual? To really have an index in one place where people could find out what they're going to be impacting when they made these reservoirs or the new road or a new state park. Where should we butt pull the park? Where should we, what should we do and where? So we had organizations like state parks that acquired land. We had the, the wildlife commission that was active at the time, still buying land, but trying to get the best land and the, with the most unusual species that are part of our heritage in North Carolina, took an organization that really cataloged what we have here and had the right botanical names or zoological names for those species. It was quite exciting getting out and going places where Dr. Wells had gone years ago or finding pitcher plants that Richie Bell had found years ago. It was really a, a wonderful experience to travel that much and to get out and see as many places that we still had. And then to try to identify ones that needed to stay. What are the important places? And the Nature Conservancy needed that kind of information too. Early on, they were accused way early on, of buying pretty places over and over again, just because it was lovely. Oh, let's have another one of those. And all of a sudden, they looked at their portfolio of preserves before they became here to North Carolina and realized they were buying all the same things over and over again. They weren't getting a diversity of habitats. They were tending to uh, find the same things attractive. Well, all things that are interesting biologically aren't necessarily pretty. So you got to look at the bigger picture and find out what's important. Where is it? Who owns it? What can we do about it? The heritage program has it still exists in North Carolina. It's had some hard times. One of the reasons is because you tell people things they don't want to know, which is, yes, this is a federally listed species that's growing here. And if you put that road there, you got to talk with the Fish and Wildlife Service, or this is a major loss. This is the only place where this is. So it really sometimes doesn't make you the most popular group in the world. Um, but we did it anyway. And we learned a lot. And we met a lot of people. <laughs> Eventually, I became the one who talked to people. I don't know if it's because I'm not afraid of talking to people or just I talk a lot. But it was quite fascinating knocking on doors and letting people know what they had on their property. One time, the garden got a call from a good Linda Lamb, who I said was funding this book. And she had been stopping on her way home to Wilson by a boggy area for years that had pitcher plants. And her husband came by home one day and said, Linda, you know that place you always make me pull over so you can look at those plants? Well, there's a big pile of sand in it. Well, she called the garden. I called the man who owned it. It was a little gas station on a cross crosswords to the east of Middlesex where the blueberries grow with so many interesting things down that way. 
So I called the man and he said, yeah, lady, if you want to come down here. Well, we showed up with, but we had a step van. I think it had been used to move mice around by the university. Was that what it was, Charlotte? A stinky big van. And we took that down and we dug a lot of interesting plants out of that little bog. It was probably about half as big as this room, but it was smack full of stuff. And I went in to thank Mr. Raper, his name was, coincidentally. And he was about this big and he had one eye that went that way. And I think he was missing a tooth or two. But he looked up at me and said, lady, if anybody told me it was important, I wouldn't have done it. That's the story of conservation. If people don't know, they're not gonna do the, good, the right thing for the most part. They have to be informed. It's not like everybody knows everything. Uh, some do. I was visiting a landowner because of a bog we knew about in the North Carolina mountains. And uh, I think it was spruce pine area. And he had this very rare orchid. And the reason I'm showing these stamps is because when we went to his office in a sleazy part of downtown Charlotte, we thought, who works in this place? And then we went, and I can't remember his name, but I can see him just like he's sitting right where you are. Morrison. Huh? Morrison, that was it, Morrison. And he said, why are you here? And we had made an appointment and we told him, he said, yes, I was wondering when you were gonna get here. And he pulled this set of, of orchid stamps out of his desk. He knew what he had. He was one of the few people you ever meet who knew it's that little pink one down here. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he knew what he had and he was happy to work with us, but he made it a game, I can tell you that. It was really fascinating to deal with him. And the story goes on about him. He bought so, he'd already owned tons of land over North, all around North Carolina. Uh, the World's Edge, is that what it's called? Um, Genevieve Joseph with the Nature Conservants, you may have seen a lot of the property that he owned went to good conservation owners. It was wonderful what he did. And he had a girlfriend who ended up with all the land. And then she worked with everybody to get it distributed. At, and I'm sure she sold a lot of it too to the conservation groups. But that was one of the, I met a lot of interesting people, but he was one of the real surprises. But he owned a great bog with a wonderful orchid and he loved it. And he was happy to do things. And most people I found, if you explain it to them, they are happy to work with you. Some of them get it right off the bat and some don't. People, other people I've met would say, oh yeah, those students from NC State used to come down here. They always like to dig around on that bluff and look for things. There were big shells down there. And then I'd say, yeah, the shells. And then there are these, these ferns too. Well, show us the ferns. And so you would meet people. And if you could engage with them and not talk too fancy and not just talk in botanical names, you could usually make pretty good progress with them. It really wasn't that difficult once you figured out their interests. If they were farmers, it was easy. This developer of the ski slopes was a lot harder. <laughs> All kinds of interesting people who are willing to, to engage in conservation if they know what they have and what they can do about it. That's a you have to explain what the organism needs. Does it need fresh running water? Does it need ponded water? Does it need to be burned periodically? What are the management needs? Because if you want them to look after it, you gotta explain what's gonna keep it there and what's not gonna keep it there. I left here in 1990 and traveled through the South. I ended up in Mississippi working on a military installation and we had a very rare relative, a quill wart, a relative of ferns. It was federally endangered and mainly only, only known then from uh, Louisiana, the Louisiana quillwort. Well, we found a lot of it. Actually, it should have been the Mississippi quillwort. And it was growing on this military installation and they were getting ready to build a new range. And I shouldn't make fun of Mississippi, but it's really different than here. And a set of engineers showed up and we had to talk to them. Well, I hadn't seen people dress like that in years. I mean, it was just amazing that people dressed that well and who knows where their suits came from and the ties were gorgeous. So we worked with them. They kept designing how the water was gonna run under the, the impact area. And 
they kept designing it wrong. And finally, we explained it. It needed ponded water at a certain time of year, then drained in another time of year. You just didn't need a pond. You needed something with flowing water on a certain schedule. And a man who was associated with the herbarium here years ago, a man named Steve Leonard, an excellent botanist was down there too. And I finally said, Stevie, explain it to him in simplest terms. Don't talk about megaspores anymore. <laughs> Make it so he can understand. And when it was over, I'll never forget that gorgeous engineer standing up. Maybe his suit was gorgeous or whatever. <laughs> he said, I didn't think I was going to have to, I needed to understand the sex life of a Louisiana quill wart to build this range. <laughs> but I got it. And the next plan came back and it was adequate. It wasn't a good thing to lose that much habitat, but at least the water was going to flow the right way and it was going to work. So it, that's translating. That's taking science and making it understandable to people. Now, it did help that it was a federally listed species, so he had to listen, but he was anxious to get that range built and he didn't want any more delays because of this Louisiana quill work. So, so much of what we do is translating in the conservation agenda. It's not simple oh just look after it it really is fun if you know or not and we have so many opportunities now to learn about our outer world how many of you all have gotten your newsletter from the garden well i love the the pink cone flower now i want to tell you all i that had been in the herbarium had been misidentified years ago and I straightened it out, which was good because now it's federally listed. But anyway, this is a wonderful article on Penny's Bend, the natural area north of Durham. How many of you all have been to Penny's Bend? I know a lot of you all have been to, well, and what I really like is this wonderful illustration of the geology and how the river works there. Be sure and look at your issue because it really does a great job. Well, the land is actually owned by the Corps of Engineers. It's in the upper end of the Falls Reservoir. A couple built a house on it before it became, was purchased by the Corps and they really didn't want to leave. And it worked out so that it's actually been leased to the Botanical Garden to manage. And for years people lived, I think there's still people, aren't there? Living in the house there that look after it. It takes a lot of management. It's a prairie-like situation because of a very interesting soil type. It, the, well, you all have been there. The geology is distinct. And so the soil pH is really high. People grazed it in the past. Well, now we have to do a lot of burning and different management to keep it open. There are wonderful aerial photos in here too that show how it changed over 20 or 30 years, how the junipers came in. We used to cut Christmas trees and let people give them away because it uh, was such a high pH. You all noticed in certain areas how many red cedars you get when the soil pH goes up. And keeping that place open takes a lot of work. And the garden is propagating uh, the native plants that are there to reestablish in certain areas. The cone flower for one, another favorite name, hoary pacoon. There's just all kinds of things. Babtesia, the blue Babtesia is there. Incredible diversity of plants. So the garden is taking care of a good bit of Penny's Bend. But the other organization that came about soon after the heritage program was the North Carolina Plant Conservation Program. Richie Bell was involved with that to start with. Back then, as I talked about people collecting plants and not propagating plants, he felt that we needed a program to work with the nursery industry to stop this evil practice, at least not to have it be encouraged to go on. And then, Department of Agriculture ended up being North Carolina Department of Agriculture, the agency in which the plant conservation program was nested because they dealt with the nursery industry. And that was felt that that was the right way to go. Instead of the heritage program that doesn't acquire land, the plant conservation program could acquire land. It also issues permits for working with endangered species and annually does a ginseng permits that people to dig ginseng, um, you have to have a permit or it can be confiscated from you. So the plant conservation program started and to start with, it was really a regulatory agency, but now, and I can brag on this, and Damon had been the chairman of the board and now I am, there are 24 preserves in North Carolina from the mountains to the sea. And some of them are things that aren't terribly unusual. 
the big leaf magnolia. You all know the one that has the biggest leaves and the biggest flowers. Well, there's very few places in North Carolina that it grows. But west of uh, Charlotte, there's a wonderful area called Red Layer Preserve. Have any of you all been there? Well, you need to go. It's fascinating. It's a good sized preserve, but there are a lot of the magnolia that grow there. So that's a plant that if you go to Mississippi, it's all over the place in Louisiana. But in North Carolina, it's not many places. So sometimes we work on what's at the edge of a range of a plant. And then other times we work on ones that have a national range. This particular little plant is a spice bush. What's its common, what's its scientific name? It's Lindera melissifolium, bog spice bush. And this one grows all over the Southeast into Missouri. I spent decades working on this plant, trying to figure out where it was. We couldn't find it in North Carolina. We knew it was in South Carolina. And we'd go down there and look at it. It was in sinkholes. And finally, I mentioned Steve Leonard earlier, the man who, the quill work man. Well, he was mapping wetlands. And he walked into a wetland in Sampson County that was solid bog spice bush. We've been looking for it for years, years. And one morning I got a call and he said, don't go to work today, call in and take the day off. I thought, well, this is interesting. And, uh, and he said, meet me at this crossroads, be there in an hour and a half. And by then I figured out what it was that he'd found was this plant, which is a federally endangered plant. And I had seen it in Missouri. I'd gone to every population that could be found. So I was really hot on this plant and he found it, um, but that was all right. That was all right. That particular Carolina Bay is where it was located. Those unusual elliptical depressions in the coastal plain, that's now owned by the plant conservation program. And when they bought that property, they got a lot of land because the, the timber company that owned it wanted to get rid of that land because it wasn't very productive. It wasn't good timber land. So they were happy to sell it to the state of North Carolina. So that particular area um, has that spice bush. It smells real good when you crush it. You all probably know the common spice bush that's in river bottoms that, uh, with the yellow flowers. This has yellow flowers too and the red berries. But that, one, that was a long time finding that plant. And it's really wonderful that now we have a, a good population of it and managing it is a problem. Talk about conservation issues. Across the road, Damon will remember, there is a landfill across the road and a landfill excavates so they can put more junk and it's gonna affect the whole drainage of that area. So sometimes you, you, you think you got it, you think you got it saved, you know what you're supposed to do and then some land use nearby. And we talked about that and over lunch today about how aquatic systems and you, how easy it is to impact areas that are wet to get that water dynamic right, to change. So the plant conservation program is now doing field trips with the botanical garden. Have any of you all been on those fields? You've been, yeah, I remember when we, we all went down to look at bays. I think it's really good when we can get these conservation groups to work together. And Genevieve Joseph who's here with the Nature Conservancy. We've done, we all do programs together to get overlap when we can. And a couple of years ago, didn't we uh, go up to the, another plant conservation program preserve near Butner and enjoyed that to see it. So I think it's important for people to get out and see areas. It's not just in theory. Some people it's just, nature is just in theory, but we prefer it to be up close and in person. So we have various organizations that have preserves and the Botanical Garden is on a fundraising drive now uh, for Stillhouse Bottom. How's that going? Contract has been signed and we cut a check for the down payment for help for all the land and water fund grant comes through and we purchase that property. That's wonderful. And the botanical garden has several other preserves also. Penny's been being the one I'm most involved with. And now we have another one. They have several other ones around, but they all take management. They take, they take work. Unless you're a mountaintop. I mentioned a lot of organizations and I want to say particularly, and we talked about this at lunch today about land trusts 
And here in this area, we have the Triangle Land Conservancy that works on the Triangle Planning Area. We also have land trust from the coast to the mountains. Chuck, how many land trusts are in North Carolina now? And the important thing about local land trusts is they look after what's in your backyard. The things that are important to you that you see every day. A lot of organizations like the Plant Conservation Program or the Nature Conservancy are really interested in acquiring and preserving extremely unusual areas. But think about the things that we enjoy that when we look out our windows, when we go across an area, trying to keep those areas intact is really what most of the local land trusts are, work on. And we're lucky to have the Triangle Land Conservancy here. I'm involved with the Coastal Land Trust because that's a particular part of the North Carolina I'm interested in. Uh, Ballhead has a conservancy. Uh, what is the Three Rivers uh, Conservancy over on one river bottom? What's that area? So we have more land trusts all scattered across the state. And if you all aren't all here or have interest elsewhere, look into what those land trusts do. They all need help. A while ago, I was talking to somebody who's involved with giving out a lot of money. And they didn't like something that the conservation groups in North Carolina were doing. And they said, well, why would they take money from that organization? And I said, none of them have enough money to operate or look after areas. Con land conservation in this part of the world is pretty pricey and there's not much money coming for it. And so land trusts sometimes uh, acquire, take money from organizations that maybe when we learn more about them, we're not quite so crazy about them. But please support local land trust. If you want to look at things to look after your backyard, as well as the really unusual things, we need to have local constituencies to help with those efforts because it's, um, they can go so fast. It happens mighty fast. I'm gonna change topics slightly here. How many of you all have been to talks here by Doug Ptolemy? Do you all know who I mean? If you haven't, you need to learn about this man. If he comes back, and I hope we can get him back again. He's an entomologist from Delaware. And I heard him talk about 15 years ago when he was just beginning to get into his stride. stride is a good way. And look at all the books. He said, The Nature of Oaks, Bringing Nature Home, Nature's Best Hope. He connects insects to all the things that we're interested in. The best story I like is when the one he tells about a chickadee and what a chickadee eats when it's little. It doesn't eat bird seed. It eats caterpillars and its parents feed it with bugs. Where do those insects come from? Where are they? Well, I really didn't believe him to start with when he said oaks were the most important source. Of, there are more caterpillars and insects that feast on and live on oaks than any other species. Now, cherries aren't bad and a couple other ones, but it's really the oaks that are so important. Well, I thought that, yeah, yeah, sure. Until I lived, moved here and live in a yard that has seven oaks this big. And I have, I put out bird food and I have uh, bird bass, but I have more birds in my yard than anybody on my block because I got more oaks and I didn't believe it, but now I do. And th his, he's such a self-effacing person, wouldn't you say? Uh, those of you all have met him. What he's done is pull things together that show how all these things work together. That, you know, you, you, well, well, the pollinator business was great when people understood we were losing pollinators and how important our food stuffs were, but also how pollinators work. Well, he goes beyond pollinators into the whole insect system and has a really wonderful stories of his own yard in a commercial neighborhood that he's put together with native plants and what showed up. I really would, these are my favorite books. You can find them here in the, um, gift shop. I would suggest that you all become familiar with him. I think he is the most important people, person in conservation for the general public without, but he is a specialist. He's a PhD entomologist who teaches at University of Delaware. Take a look at these sometimes or uh, see if you can find him. If he comes again, listen to him. There's so much that we have to work together to make it all come together, that it's not just one species that we manage. It's just not the birds or not the plants. My neighbor only has cultivated plants in her yard. 
just drives me crazy and because she spends so much money on them. And I, I, I'm trying to figure out how to approach her. Now, if I can talk to that man with no teeth and a few other people, I should be able to talk to my own neighbor, don't you think? To get her to do something a little different. And uh, her heart's in the right place, but her knowledge isn't quite there. And so we'll have to have to work on her. And I think that we all have to talk to each other more. I'll get back to that message in a minute. I talk about educating people. For years, I've taught botany classes. And Carla, who's here, uh, and you've been here with, I, when I was at nature camp, I would try to make people key out plants and look at all the plant parts and the stigmas do this and how many stamens and how many petals. God, I work hard trying to get people to pay attention because that's how you identified things back then. You all have seen all these cute little handbooks. You could put them in your pocket and take them. I have actually, Dot Wilbur and I wrote one that's never been published. Now everybody just wants to take a picture of it and have some, some, something identify it for them. Now I'll tell you, you can get in lots of trouble with that. I was with a very smart young woman who's an ornithologist and we were down at uh, Orton Plantation area and we were seeing last fall, all these gorgeous fall wildflowers. And she kept taking a picture and having some, something identify them. Of the seven things she looked at, eight of, seven of the eight were wrong. Now she is finishing her PhD in ornithology. That girl should be able to learn how to identify a plant, don't you think? I really had to be some kind of mean to her about the eighth time that this is not the way you learn things. Part of plants, I've doing it with plants I've learned is to really look at them. And at Nature Camp, I stopped using this book except for the people who really wanted to use it or even the field guides. We just get a couple of big vases of plants, flowers along the roadsides or where, and we look at them and we tear them apart. We get to the same thing, but I'm doing it a different way now. It's okay, this is a mint. Why is it a mint? Well, because square stems, they know that, but other things. So we really start looking at plants. And this gets to the point statement about plant blindness. Getting people to really look at flowers is fun. It really is fun. And you learn so much about how they function. A couple of years ago, Ken and I did a class at Cullowee. Have any of you all ever been to the Cullowee Native Plant Symposium? Well, it's a great thing for people interested in growing native plants. It's held at, uh, on the campus of University of North Carolina at Cullowee, is that its official name? Western Carolina. Well, it was decided that um, the book that Dot and I worked on, we would use that and we would take people out before the conference to the Blue Ridge Parkway and help them learn how to identify plants. And we picked out some good areas and we had plant material and we gathered everybody up and out we went. And there's one woman and her husband, I could tell she was gonna be a pill. Uh, <laughs> Because she wanted, why do I need to learn how to do this? I can get someone to tell me what this is. And I thought, oh God, we're gonna have her all day long. So we got to a nice overlook where we picked out, we had benches and we were sitting and we got hand lenses for everybody. And somehow I managed to separate the husband and wife. And he was, and I said, here, take this hand lens. He said, I don't need one. And I said, yes, you do. And I grabbed his hand and handed him a hand lens and said, look at your, the hair on your hand. Well, he wasn't interested in the plants, but he sure was interested in the hand lens. And so he just kept looking at things and we handed him all kinds of plant material and looked at the stamens and the stigmas and where the seeds were forming. And he became quite entranced. She didn't, but he did. So at the end of the conference, which had been a good one, uh, we were packing up and leaving and this man yelled across the parking lot and I thought, oh, that man. And I walked over and he said, my wife's been dragging me around to these conferences for years. I had no idea how plants worked. And then he said, and I don't think she'll ever know. <laughs> but he got it and he really got into it. And he said, this is the best time he'd spent at any conference, really learning to look and how the parts worked and how you form seeds and how the pollen works. You know, it's like, it was just miraculous, but I loved it when he said, but she'll never learn. And she wouldn't probably. Ken Moore, who I've mentioned, 
is now in Virginia. And he sent me a set of handouts from the Virginia Native Plant Society. And this is his favorite, do I have to mow all that? <laughs> and part of it is encouraging people to give up their yards, they're their maintaining their gardens, uh, maintaining their lawns. And this, these have, we need to do this in North Carolina too, because it really talks about alternatives and gives you some ideas about other things you can do and giving cover for plants and uh, how can I make a difference? changing our landscape, why choose native plants. It's a good little handout. So there are plenty of them here, so you all pick them up. But that's what we got to do in our own neighborhoods. And that is one of the things that Ptolemy talks about is we can all contribute. We can all make a difference in our own gardens. And if my neighbor ever gives up going all her cultivated plants, we'll have at least two houses in our neighborhood. And there's one up the street that's pretty good uh, who are doing the same. And that adds up over time. We can make a difference. Uh, in our own neighborhoods. We can belong to organizations. And I encourage you all to join land trusts, native plant groups. None of it's terribly expensive, but it's terribly helpful to those organizations to continue. But also in your own backyard to think about what you can do differently. I have no yard at all. I mean, I have lots of yard. I have no grass whatsoever. I have a marvelous moss collection. That's because the soil is so bad. So we can do a lot on our own backyards. We can also support groups, but we all have to work on it. Not one, there's not one single solution to this. There are multiple solutions. I've really enjoyed working in the conservation world, but it's a very depressing business when you do it for a living. It's all about loss. Anything we can do to bring a little bit of nature back, to give it a chance and to bring us simple pleasure. That's the real thing. Is it not always important for the bigger picture, it's important to us and what we see every day around us can bring so much joy. And when you can't get out, you can look out the window. I found a funny book that used to be here in the garden and the garden library decided to get rid of it uh, because garden clubs and spades. And it's a real funny thing. And I think David made a copy of this for me. Let me see if I can find this. I'll pass this around to, oop, I've lost it. No, here it is. It's two women standing out by an immaculate yard that has a lot of grass and trees here and shrubs right by the entrance of the house. Two women are talking to each other and one says, you can see my problem, there's no mystery. <laughs> one of the great things about having a garden and watching it and having a diversity of species, you'll agree with me, Tom Hunter, won't you? Is seeing what happens and what comes up. It may not be what you planned, but to see what happens is just absolutely intriguing. And it teaches us so much, but I never thought I'd find a cartoon that was that funny and appropriate to how we should get rid of some of our lawns and start uh, growing a diversity of species, whether it's things you can eat or whether it's things that help pollinators. We have opportunities and I would encourage you all to make the effort to see something in your backyard or your front yard that's gonna bring you pleasure every day because it certainly brings me pleasure. Thank you. Oh gosh, I forgot the fly traps. Yeah. May I have one more minute? Maybe two. The person who created this gorgeous fly trap is here with us today. Cynthia, raise your hand. Please look in the gift shop. You'll see the other things she's created. Even. Um, pitcher plants, which I now have a wonderful one, and also uh, trout lilies and a blood root and different things made out of paper. And they're fun because these can be used for teaching. They're botanically correct. So take a look at those. But that leads me to what my current mission is. And I'm so glad you reminded me. I'm into Venus flytraps in a really big way. And they're proposed for federal listing as an endangered species. And most of you probably know they're only in a little bit of North Carolina and South Carolina. We're, those are the two fastest growing counties on the East Coast, the one in North Carolina and Horry County in South Carolina. We are losing the habitat for these plants as we speak. I've, as Damon mentioned when we talked earlier, I've really worked to engage private landowners and I've met a lot of landowners. I wanna meet more. And now I have an advocate with Anne here to help me with this. People who are volunteering to help with fly trap work. I have a motel owner in Boiling Springs Lake who's gotten the town to make the fly trap their mascot for the town. 
I met somebody who has a, a uh, RV park in Holden Beach. They were repainting their little train thing that takes people around, a little shuttle, getting rid of the tiki head on it. They're planting a fly trap on it because they know how many fly traps there are in their neighborhood. We're getting ready for a major rescue effort down there because a lot of the property is going to be drained to improve uh, the lake. The people who want to work on fly traps are so much fun. I've met such different people and not all of them are particularly well-educated or normally interested in conservation, but it's just amazing who will step forth and everybody loves fly traps. I've worked on so many species that nobody likes but me. <laughs> and a lot of them aren't attractive either, but this is a winner. And the botanical garden you all know has a wonderful collection of insectivorous plants. Johnny Randall works so much with propagating them. This little organization that we've started uh, called venusflytrapchampions.org, look on our website. I'm known for being deadly serious and it was suggested we even have a comic page or a fun page. So we have cartoons too, and we have tattoos that people made like Venus flytraps. So we're including a lot of information. We now have a new contest for where the biggest flytraps grow. And all you have to do is put a penny beside the flytrap and take a picture and send it to us because that's the metric is the penny. And we're getting a few entries already. It's mainly for biologists who are out worried wandering around in the woods, mainly in zoologists, they run into lots of fly traps too. And so they're it's, it's kind of an in-house thing to find the biggest ones. And uh, somebody sent me a picture of a fly trap eating a pencil. And <laughs> you just never know what you're going to get. Please pick at these up and take a look and look at the website on the back. This is, um, you all know fly traps, how rare they are. But if we don't do something in the next 20 years, they're only going to be in captivity at botanical gardens and a few places like that. So let, let's work on that. Thank you. I'm so glad you reminded me of this, Chuck. Does anybody, does anybody have any questions for me or comments? Many of you all are in the conservation business or have worked a lot here at the garden. How do we get involved with the flytrap rescue missions? Julie Moore, get a hold of me. We have also engaged the, um, there's a North American Saracenia Conservation Group. And they've given money to the Nature Conservancy to do burning and to the plant conservation program. Well, they are gonna help us organize that because they have a lot of experience with moving plants. And so we're looking for places in the Boiling Springs area uh, to, to use as a preserve. And there's a native plant society's chapter down there that just contacted me last week that wanna help on that effort. So really you can get a hold of me and we'll try to plug you in to how that's gonna happen. So don't hesitate to find me. And you can go through comments on our website uh, on that regard. It's going to take a lot of work. And where are you going to move them? You got to figure out how you're going to manage them. That's the other part of the deal. And I also want to establish a place like the Stanley Reader Insectivorous Garden in, um, in downtown Wilmington. Have any of you all been there? It's a really cool place. And we hope to do the same thing uh, between Southport and Boiling Springs and have a, a garden there with a rescued plant material and also to interpret it for people. Of course, there's always a problem of people stealing things. And someone at lunch, we were talking about the th thievery. Well, fortunately, cameras aren't as expensive as they used to be. So we see a lot of effort to put cameras in places uh, where the public really goes. We're coming to the end of our time, and I have one question, one more question from the virtual audience uh, that is a good one to end on. So for folks, what's a good place to start for folks who really, this is their first venture into conservation and learning about conservation, places to volunteer, et cetera? Yes. One of the things I didn't mention is early on here at the garden, one of my jobs was teaching the volunteers. It's like you had, if you wanted to volunteer, you got to tell them what you want the volunteer to do. And that was a lot of fun working with uh, volunteers. And it's a wonderful way to learn about an area. Here at the, this garden, we have a lot of volunteers and they're people who collect seeds and just think about the little packages of seeds that are available this year. There's just so many different things that you can volunteer to do. I also suggest. Uh, Julie, how can we, I get one of those really nice looking magazines called Conservation? Well, I know. I think you have to be a botanical garden member. Is that the case? Please join the Botanical Garden and the Native Plant Society. If you like the garden, if you like to go on field trips, uh, look on our local area. The, the Triangle Land Conservancy has great trips. What do you all do? Many of you all are engaged with these groups. What do you suggest? 
become a member of the garden. Yes, but what other groups? Ed Harrison, what do you think? What groups do you think people should get involved with? Always start here. All right, but we got to go a little broader than that. Eno River Association, a good local land trust, the Botanical. Um, we have a Triangle Land Conservancy needs volunteers. Uh, the Nature Conservancy has volunteers, don't you? So there are a variety of things you can do. Sometimes it's just paperwork. Sometimes it's getting out and pulling weeds. There's so many different things you can do, but reach out and find out. I think if you can figure out something that's easy for you to get to, and it isn't like you have to go all the way to the mountains to do it, find something in your backyard. It would be my first uh, suggestion. And don't do something you don't want to do. Figure out what you're good at. Well, Julie, thank you so much. It's been great to have you here. And for folks in the audience, please join us for a reception in the breezeway afterwards. You'll have more time to ask Julie some questions there. And as mentioned, please, if you're not a member, join the North Carolina Botanical Garden. It's a great way to connect with conservation. It's critical to our mission. If you're on Zoom, David will be sending out a link to you. And if you're in the room, we have some membership information on the, on the uh, table right outside the door. So please consider joining. And thanks to all who are already members.